Hello again and welcome to the War Zone. Um, I don't mean to be facetious, but this is the beginning of a series about bridal warfare because uh, while we are waiting for our bridegroom, while we're making ourselves ready for our wedding day, what does that look like? Because Yeshua said to his Talmudin, his disciples, occupy until I return. That's a Greek word that doesn't mean sit around and take up space. It means to rehearse. It means to do this repeatedly every day. To do what? To take our authority that we've been given as the betrothed of the bridegroom that is in the kingdom. And so just as we are to rehearse the festivals every year, remember that word in Hebrew from the uh, Torah is mikra. It's a rehearsal for the appointments that the Messiah will keep with the earth. We are to be rehearsing the keys to the kingdom that he's given us until he returns and redeems his bride. So uh, in looking at this, I see a lot of the bridal party and the members of the Christian church living in defeat. It's as if they don't know what to do. I mean, they hear the words because they read the surface level. And remember the words of Rabbi Joe, beware of the bias of the translators. So today, I want to begin talking about where does this war take place? We're here on the earth. This is the home of the bride. But while we're making ourselves ready to go to the, the chedar, the wedding chamber, there's warfare going on because the prince of this world has taken his, what he thinks is his dominion over the earth and he's wreaking havoc. And if you don't believe me, just listen to the six o'clock news about what's happening in the earth. We're having more earthquakes as well, and we're having disasters. We're having snowstorms prematurely that are wiping out 50% of the cattle in the Midwestern states. And Fukushima just had another earthquake this week. So we've got to realize that where is our authority in all of this, and do we have to put up with this? And the answer is absolutely not. But this is a war zone. And the reason we are given spiritual armor is so that we know how to actively, proactively fight against these things. So there's so many directions I could go. But I wanted to make mention of something very interesting. Um, the war is not what we see. It's actually an unseen uh, war zone. And the enemies are coming through gateways and doors and portals through other uh, uh, heavenly dimensions. Some of the doorways and portals actually go into the bowels of the earth. Scriptures talk about that a lot. There are parables about that. But in the end times especially, it is the war in the heavenlies that we need to be uh, particularly aware of and how we're going to um, fight that battle. Remember, um, the battle is um, ours, but we're fighting it, but the victory belongs to us. The battle is the Lord's. That's what he told us. Now, I'm going to be sharing from some several books as we go along. I think one of the most important books that I read in my lifetime was written in the late 1800s by E.W. Bullinger. It's called The Witness in the Stars. There are messages in the heavens. And going back to Torah, Genesis, the book of Bereshit, God said that he would use this, the um, greater uh, light and the lesser light, the sun and the moon, and the stars of the heaven to be signs for us. And he saw this, um, Bullinger saw this even over a hundred years ago. He could see the witness that was in the stars, and I think we need to revisit that today. Also, um, piggyback onto that it is the late Pastor G. James Kennedy, who found Bullinger's work and he added on his own understanding which is a very good one and it's called the real meaning of the zodiac. We shouldn't shy away from the zodiac or astrologies just because some people have perverted it. The enemy is good at perverting what God has designed, has created. So what God has created is a good thing. So let's dig in and find the good thing about the zodiac. And finally, this is a Jewish book called The Wisdom of the Hebrew Months by Zvi Rizman. And he was a writer of um, studying the stars. He had a, he's also, I think, a Kabbalist, but we're not going to get into Kabbalah, which is the 
uh, the mystery religions, it's the mystical side that, of the dark side, in my opinion. It's the wrong gateway. It's the wrong portal that we're going to be looking at. But it has some good information nonetheless. And finally, today I'm going to be teaching out of the Hebrew Greek Key Study Bible. I think that this is a one, good one for understanding what did it really say about the war zone. We, there's a lot of words that are mistranslated, in my opinion, in the New Testament. So let us begin. Now, um, interestingly enough about gates and portals and etc., the word gates um, appears over 200 times in the Tanakh. It appears 13 times in the New Testament. I don't know why it's so much more in the old, but you see, once um, Yeshua, our Messiah, overcame hell and the grave, and he opened the gates of hell to go in and take and bring captivity captive, and he opened the gates of heaven, then we can see the significance. So, in the New Covenant, my papers keep going around because I decided to come outside today. It's a beautiful day here. And, in um, God's kingdom. But um, getting back to the gates and portals, um, interestingly, the word doors and uh, doors and door singularly um, appears uh, over 200 times again in the Old Testament and 61 times in the New Testament. And I think the most important scripture in the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, as we call it, the New Betrothal Covenant, is when Yeshua, our bridegroom, said, I am the door. No man comes to my Father except through me. But if you try to get in any other way, any other doorway, any other gate, or any other portal, you are a thief and a robber. We're going to look at all of that. What did he mean by that? So, um, so I think a good starting place is to talk about what Paul wrote about the spiritual war. And in the book of Ephesians, in the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, which is our betrothal, Ketubah, he said, finally, brethren, and this is chapter 6, verse 10, beginning verse 10. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. And it continues on in verse 19, And as for me, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of this gospel. What is the mystery that he's talking about regarding spiritual warfare? So it wasn't just surface information you put on the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, and all of that. Um, in later series, I'm going to go into that in detail and tell you what that looks like because it's not a good translation and some of it is just very bad idioms. That when you take it, remember, from Hebrew into Latin Vulgate into Greek and then try to put it back into English and you've got several versions of English, it's obviously going to lose some meaning and understanding. So we want to the best of our ability with the guidance of the Ruach HaKodesh the Holy Spirit. We will understand these things. But I want to just take this part that I just read you uh, uh, and take it into the Hebrew. And what is this really saying? When it says to be strong in the Lord, it says, finally, brethren, we can say mishpocha. It's the family. It's the bridal party. Be strong in the Lord. Interesting, that word strong in Greek is endumenamo. The root word is dunamis. And it means a miraculous power and a worker of miracles. Wow. So, Paul is admonishing or exhorting, I should say, his uh, disciples that in order to fight this war, you've got to be in supernatural armor. You've got to be in supernatural power. You've got to be a worker of miracles. That's that rehearsing and doing daily that I was talking about. So, consider for yourself, when is the last time you performed a miracle? I think this is where the bride has been, has been shut away from truth. Because, you know, if she really had and grabbed on to the truth of what is available to her through her new covenant ketubah, 
then some of these mega church systems wouldn't be necessary, would they? And maybe that therein lies the problem, that uh, there's a competition for the control of this power. However, so being strong in the Lord means that you are operating in miraculous power and you are a worker of miracles. Then it says, um, in the power of his might, and that word is kratos iskos. Now, that means you forcefully exercise the dominion you've been given. What dominion? In a previous teaching, I talked about the fact that you've been given dominion over the earth. It was given to Adam and Eve from the very beginning. And even though they fell from grace, they were cast out of the garden, the Gani Don, the Garden of Eden, God never took the dominion back. We have always had dominion over the earth. And I think we've lost sight of this because now, because of our bridegroom and what he did at Calvary and his death and resurrection, our dominion is now just not over the earth, but we have dominion to access the kingdom power as well. So we have dominion in the heavenlies if we just take it. We, we don't know, how will they know unless one sends a teacher to tell them that this is the good news? This is part of the mystery of the good news gospel that Paul was referring to. Armor. Okay, it says, put on the whole armor of God. And that word is hoplan. It's an offensive weapon of war. Now, when we look at the surface information about the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth, it appears to be defensive armor. And the shield of trust, the shield of faith, will deflect the fiery dice. It, if, it appears in what I've been taught that this is a defensive mechanism so that it will protect us and hide us behind you know, the armor and, they, and the enemy can't get to us. Wrong, according to the original word, which is hoplan, it is an offensive weapon. So all of those pieces of armor that are discussed, and we're going to go into what they really mean, they are offensive weaponry. We should be on the on the you know proactively on the assault against them before we get attacked. We should know what to do before that even happens. We should never have to submit to the wiles of the evil one. And so then it says, when you've done this, that you stand, do all that you can to stand. And the word is histemi, and it means to establish yourself in the covenant you've been given. What covenant? It's our wedding ketubah. It's our betrothal contract. Be established. Do you think that Messiah is going to let his bride be unprotected? No. No, he has given us the weapons of our war for, which are not carnal but mighty through God and the pulling down of strongholds. That is an offensive arm. The wiles of the devil. This is interesting. The word wiles is the word methodia, and it means the method. So it's talking about uh, a pattern that Satan has already used in the past. Remember, there's nothing new under the sun. That which has been before will be again. King Solomon wrote that. And uh, the... Oh, the what the devil has done his wilds are methods that he uses and it also says it only appears one time in the new testament and that's in this ephesians 6 scripture isn't that interesting it only the wiles of the devil it only appears one time and it means interestingly it, it means literally traveling over and lying in wait so traveling over that means he's up there in the heavenlies and just as the Father is looking in heaven and his eyes are searching to and fro for someone who will stand in the gap for him, he's talking about his bride. The enemy is traveling over too, and so are his minions, looking for who's not, who is not uh, dressed in their bridal armor and who they can attack. So, and, or they're lying in wait. It's an ambush. It's an ambush. That's what he wants to do. That, that's his method. That's the wiles of the, of the devil. And the word devil does not appear even one time in the Old Testament. How curious is that? It's usually referred to as the adversary or his other names, the prince of Tyre and Persia and Babylon. But the word devil itself, Diablo, as we would refer to it in the Latin, 
doesn't show up in the uh, Tanakh. But it means a traducer, an adversary, and an accuser. So he is the accuser of the brethren and uh, the accuser of Mishpachai, the bride. He accuses us day and night. However, if we are proactively activating this armor and doing what we've been uh, commanded and taught to do, then there's no need for us to uh, stand in fear. We are aggressively going after this evil one. And then it says wrestle. We wrestle not with flesh and blood. Well, the flesh and blood is obvious. And what it's saying is our enemy is not people. It's not humans. Although sometimes humans are influenced by the evil one. But the real enemy is the unseen enemy. And that's what's translated in English. But there is no word in the Greek. I, it, it's not as if they added it. But there just is no word for this in the Greek. So we just need to understand wrestling means fighting not cowering back and defending ourselves fighting but proactively aggressively going after it it is the offensive weapon of our warfare principalities um, part of the enemy that we that we wrestle against it's the word RK and it means the highest ranking in spiritual authority so there are like an army of legions of, of our enemy it's spiritually the unseen enemy and the principalities are the highest ranking the chief ones the powers where it says you wrestle against powers principalities rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places the powers are superhuman influences so we are influenced by the things we see by the media by the things that come to our senses but, the, but these things that are influencing us very often are superhuman. We can't see them. They're not flesh and blood. It's not really a commercial on TV or a movie or a game or the internet or social media. It's not really. These, the enemies of our soul have gotten their minions to work uh, 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 you know, in this area. But it's really a superhuman influence. The rulers of the darkness, the word is cosmos crater, don't you? <laughs> the rulers of the darkness of this world, and it means those that rule this world. So you have the principalities up in the heavenlies, but then there are rulers in this world that are unseen. Uh, so we're just, I mean, this is everywhere. We're surrounded by all of this evil, and yet Hebrews tells us we are also surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses those in heaven who are interceding for us and with us and standing with us. Um, the high places. Uh, Ur the, the word is Uranus, like the planet. Some call it Uranus. I like to say Uranus. It's a, it was uh, named from the Greek mythology, but it's also the Greek word that is used for high places. And uh, Uranus is was in, in Greek mythology father sky he was married to the mother earth which in the Greek is Gaia you might have heard that word it's it's used a lot today but in Hebraic history when you go back to the Hebrew history the Hebrew mythologies uh, which are legends that are handed down oral Torah whatever you want to call it Uranus was Nimrod the king of Babylon and uh, the word in Ephesians literally means an elevation above the sky coming from eternity so high places is the word Uranus like the planet which is the Greek word for Nimrod and it's a location above the sky coming from eternity that means if it's coming from eternity it's above the sky and yet it's coming into our atmosphere it's coming into this dominion or dimension it's got to be a portal that gets you here there they're coming through portals and stargates they're coming through these gateways and that's why we want to learn more about what are the gateways what are the portals what are these doors that are opening and closing all around us and how can we take dominion and authority over them that we might close those doors this is the part what bridegroom was saying our messiah was saying 
I will shut a door that no man can open, and I will open the door that no man can shut. He's talking about warfare. He's talking also about the wedding chamber, the bridal chamber, and when we're in there, nobody can open it. But he can close these. He's given us the keys of David. He's given us the keys to unlock these gateways and portals. And uh, in the weeks ahead, um, we're going to talk about uh, the, uh, the different portals that are go into the earth because there's different layers of dimensions in the earth that are unseen and there's different layers in the heavenlies that are unseen. I call it the cosmic menorah and some of the teachings are going to be presented to you in a PowerPoint presentation so that I can show you visuals of what I'm finding in a little bit in the Zohar but mostly in the, um, the Tanakh and some of these writings of the ancient uh, scientists who saw this. So um, this is what I'd like to close with in this first session, and that is reading Ephesians 6, 10, and 19 through, through 19 in the literal translation of what the scripture says. Finally, Mishpocha, become a worker of miraculous power forcefully exercising your God-given dominion. Put on the entire godly offensive instruments of war that you may be able to establish a covenant to stand against the adversary who travels over you and lies in wait to attack you. For we battle not against human beings, flesh and blood, but against those in high-ranking authority who impose superhuman influence over us, that is, both the rulers of this world who hide themselves in, obscur in obscurity and also against the unseen perpetrators of malice and depravity from the elevated places beyond this world. And that's what Ephes Ephesians 6, 10 to 19 really says. Until next time, when we learn more about gates and portals, and, and doorways and stargates and, and, and where the enemy is and isn't and how we can fight it and what is the weapon of your warfare. When we get into the armor, it's going to be glorious. But in the meantime, go take on the day. Carpe dies, as they say. This is a day that the Lord has made. You rejoice in it because that's an offensive weapon you have, the power of the tongue. We're going to get into the power of the spoken word, the logos. There are many weapons of offensive warfare, not just the ones listed in Ephesians 6. So until next time, this is Janet McBride. Have a wonderful day in the Lord, and I'll see you in the air.